Welcome to Ira's Everything Bagel, where I talk with intriguing people about everything, their passions, pursuits, and points of view. The federal government recently announced its plan to forgive student loan debt for qualified federal student loan borrowers and the resumption of federal student loan payments after December 31st, 2022. It's not the clearest subject in the world, but my guest has a passion for clarity. He's Brian Walsh, SoFi Bank's Manager of Financial Planning and Student Loan Expert, and he'll explain what borrowers should know about these plans and what is still being decided. For more information, go to SoFi.com and you can download their app, and you can follow Brian on Twitter at underscore Brian M. Walsh. And Brian, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. How did you end up in the world of banking and finance? How'd you start out in what world and how did you end up there? Honestly, I just had a really good professor when I was in college. I, I thought I was going to be an accountant for the rest of my life and had to take a introductory finance class and decided to change my major to finance. And from there, just kept on continuing my education, got my CFP, my master's, and now working on my PhD. And I just have really enjoyed it, quite frankly. Is it always a balance between the analytical financial side and the people side? Because you work with people, obviously. You work with people at work and you work with clients. So is there a way to juggle all that so it comes out reasonably well in the larger scheme of things? Honestly, I think the the people side of things is more important when it comes to personal finance than the numbers, the rules, any of that stuff. Because at the end of the day, personal finance is, is it's relatively simple. Like you need to spend less than you make. You need to save money. You need to pay off debt. These are all relatively simple concepts, but they're all really, really hard for people to do because as humans, we're not wired to make these types of decisions. Uh, so understanding how people are motivated, how to kind of trick yourself into making the right decision, I think that is far more important than the technical aspects of financial planning. Well, one of the most complicated parts of financial planning would be college and, un- and the universities. And this is what we're going to be talking about today, which is student loans. How did we get to a point where so many people, and I don't know the figure, you could probably share it with us, so many people are enmeshed in student loans and paying it back. And at the same time, now we're having this forgiveness aspect to the new legislation or executive order. How did we get there? How did we get to this point? Yeah, that is the, uh, I guess, the the $1.8 trillion question as of uh, the latest update I've seen. So I, there's about 45 million people right now with federal student loans. And you know, I think the biggest thing, if you, if you look back maybe 20, 25 years ago, over that period of time, if you look at the cost of college and how that's grown compared to how wages have grown over that same period of time, the cost of college has significantly exceeded the growth in wages. So this idea of, okay, we're going to pay our way through school or we're going to get a job and we're going to cover tuition that way. Um, or even mom and dad are going to cover it, that's becoming significantly more challenging, if not impossible. So there becomes a gap. And when there's a gap between how much college costs and you know resources you have available, then that's where borrowing comes in. And student loan borrowing in particular, especially on the federal side of things, because there's no underwriting as far as qualifying for loans and things like that. So really, student loans kind of filled that gap between the the rate of growth in college costs and then the the rate of wages and what people were able to save. Do you think that it's worth it for a student or the student's family to apply for loans if the end result of the degree is this nebulous title or degree as opposed to a very specific degree? And what I mean by that is you're going to get a, a law degree. You're going to get a medical education. These things to me make sense, or an engineering degree, these things make sense to extend yourself and go into debt. But if you're just going to get a degree, let us say in liberal arts, and it's not to denigrate liberal arts, but if you're not planning to teach it and you're not planning to do anything with it, does it make financial sense to get into debt? Yeah, I think you bring up a good point. And really the way I look at it, that whole conversation is the idea of focusing on the return on education. 
So it's not saying student loans are a good thing or a bad thing. A lot of times they're a necessary thing. And compared to other forms of debt, I would argue they're good. Too much of a good thing can still become a bad thing. So it's about taking a step back and figuring out, okay, based on the cost of tuition, the financial aid we're going to get, and the average earnings for the major that we're looking at, how much debt are we going to graduate with compared to those average earnings? And are we setting ourselves up or our son or daughter up to be in a good position or a really, really challenging position? Fortunately, I think more families that I've worked with have taken that return on education approach. And if it's majors that may not be as high earning, it would be selecting schools that may be more cost effective, maybe two-year transitioning to four-year, maybe staying local and living at home. So I think more and more families are proactively trying to take that type of approach, which is, which is very powerful. Before we get into specific suggestions and tips that you have as an expert, just looking at the macro aspect of this, if we forgive debt, whether it's student debt or any other kind of debt, we're in a way adding to the nation's debt. And we reach a point where there's the deficit and then there's the debt. And we reach a point where, and I'm always concerned about that, is at what point do you get to the point at what point do you reach a level of debt for a nation that you just can't ever pay it? And then what happens then? Does the government default and you start all over? In other words, where does that line get yeah. drawn? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. And I think, you know, looking at it from a, a debt perspective, I think what we've seen is if you're looking at kind of the economics of it and, and all that stuff, you with forgiveness and with the high debt loads, you can introduce the idea of moral hazard where it's like, okay, what incentive do people have not to take on debt or, or institutions to control costs if debt's going to be forgiven? And there's like kind of this idea of free money. And then top of that, from the government perspective, okay, if we're running greater deficits because of this, and we've seen some projections where it's, I think the Penn Morton model last week, the week before estimated, it's going to be a trillion dollars for, for what was announced. In a rising rate environment, that becomes even more costly and it creates challenges. I think that's, that to me is something where I'm not an economist. I'm not an expert there. More along the lines of me saying, okay, whether it's right or wrong, whether you believe in forgiveness or you don't believe in forgiveness, as a financial planner, let's figure out what's available. And if you can take advantage of it, great. What are the next steps? If you can't, okay, what are the next steps related to personal finances? And what are some of those steps and some of those tips for dealing with, it's a, I guess it's a, it's a concurrent situation. You've got the debt forgiveness. And on the other hand, you have an extension of the debt for people who still have to pay. So what are some of the tips that you recommend people look at? Yeah, I think a great starting point is to understand what applies to you and what was announced. So student loan forgiveness has received all of the attention in my mind, related to President Biden's announcement a, a couple of weeks back. And that's important. You also mentioned the extension of the suspension of payments and interest on federal student loans. And then there's a third part too, where it was announced to introduce new income-driven repayment options moving forward that really kind of cap payments to a certain percentage of income that is probably going to be much lower than what income-driven repayment plans are. So I think that third part might end up being more impactful to borrowers and from a cost perspective to the government as the forgiveness piece. So I think for student loan borrowers, we're saying, number one, are you eligible for forgiveness? And what that's looking like right now is up to $10,000 if you did not receive a Pell Grant, up to $20,000 if you did receive a Pell Grant. And then both of those are assuming that your income's under one twenty-five dollars if you're single and $250,000 if you're married filing jointly. So it's looking and saying, okay, am I eligible for any sort of forgiveness? If you are, what's going to be left over and how are we going to attack those? If you're not, okay, what's left over and then what's the best plan moving forward from there? So I think that's, that's where we're starting is if there's forgiveness available, are you eligible for it? What are the next steps to apply for it and get it? And then what's going to be left over? Are people generally realistic about their assessment of the need for a student loan and how to make that part of their budget? I, I think generally speaking, yes. The challenge that we're facing right now is it's human nature where if you don't have to pay something for a long enough period of time, 
you're going to forget about it. And it's going to become kind of back of mind and you're not going to factor it into your expenses, especially with how high inflation has been. Other necessities have really kind of taken up the space that was that was in place of that budget where, we, where maybe we're not paying 300 bucks a month anymore for two and a half years. So I think the transition to introducing these student loan payments back in your budget will be something that people need to be very proactive about because yes, it was realistic. Now, maybe it might be more challenging as gas and energy and all these other prices have really kind of increased over the last couple of years. How does it work with, because I was under the impression that the federal government was taking over student loans. So you're with SoFi. How does SoFi and other institutions get involved with student loans? Yeah, SoFi started in student loan refinancing. So to your point, the federal government plays a major role in financing higher education costs through federal student loans that are essentially made by the federal government. Those provide a significant amount of advantages to borrowers, but number one, they don't always cover the entire cost of college because there's a limit on how much you can borrow from the federal government. So private lenders come into play to fill that gap while they're in school. On top of that, once school's over and where SoFi really got its start was the fact that federal student loans, the interest rates set by Congress every year. It doesn't matter if you have a high credit score or a low credit score, or high income, low income, which can be fantastic. But for people who you know maybe have a good credit score, maybe have a good income compared to their debt load, their other expenses, they may be able to reduce their interest rate by going out on the private market and getting their own loan, going through underwriting, and then they can save money by refinancing that federal student loan. So that's how SoFi got into the mix was first on refinancing. And then over time, we transitioned to in-school private student loans to fill the gap above and beyond what the federal government was willing to lend. Is there a difference between a student loan for a private institution versus a public university? So for example, Harvard or Yale versus UCLA or UNLV? From a student loan perspective, not a huge difference. I, I think the biggest differences we see between public and private institutions is the sticker price that can typically is much larger for private institutions, but also on the financial aid side of things. So we, we typically will see cost differences between the two, but then the loans themselves, generally speaking, there's not a major difference. I'm always surprised that these private institutions, as I mentioned, Harvard and Yale for, for just two examples, have quite an endowment, and yet it's expensive to go. And yes, they do issue scholarships in some cases to needy students. But at the same time, to take out a loan to go to these institutions when the institutions themselves have sufficient resources to help out a little bit, maybe by offering a discount to every student, has that ever been explored? And, and if not, why not? Yeah, I, I think when we, when we look at private institutions, number one, private institutions will typically have different types of financial aid in which they will offer than public institutions. And they're going to vary across the board. So going back to the earlier point on you know, looking at the return on education, I think it's hugely important to go online and say, okay, what percentage of need-based aid do these private institutions typically cover comparing one to the other, or even comparing a private to a public school? Because there will be differences, and you can see that. Some may be better than others at really kind of meeting the need of, of their students. Beyond that, as far as the endowment piece, I, I, my wife and I have always been pretty involved in, in nonprofits throughout our adult life. And you know, typically what we see is endowments will serve different purposes. And it's the same thing to be said for, for nonprofits who may have a significant amount of assets in which only a portion of it will go towards general operating expenses on an annual basis. And the remainder is designated for other purposes. So I think that's, that's always the interesting aspect of it. But from a personal perspective, I think it's important to look at the percentage of, of need-based aid that is provided when you're exploring schools. When you get involved with a client, how deep do you get into it with them in this sense? You mentioned earlier researching different colleges and universities to compare what percentage of your income you want to devote to a possible loan payback. Do you help a client with that by researching it, or do you leave it to the client to research and then come to you for your assessment of what they found? 
Yeah, realistically, they're going to be running with a lot of kind of the, the front end work of doing the research on what schools are interested in, what majors are they looking at, what their grades are going to get them into. And then we encourage them, quite frankly, to talk to the counselors at the high school because they have some of them better than better resources than others, but they can provide great resources on that end. And then the financial aid offices at the colleges that they're looking at. And then where we really come into play is talking through, okay, here are the options. How are we actually going to analyze this and figure out, do we have enough money for this school? Here's a gap. What's the best way to fill that gap, whether it be dipping in the savings or whether it be borrowing money? things like that as we kind of go through that process. Do you ever look at a client's portfolio and say, you know, maybe it's not a good idea to take out a student loan because there's going to be problems down the road? Yeah, I I think there's a balancing act. I I, I think there's, there's saying that from a financial perspective, but then there's also understanding that there's the human element as well. And I'll, I'll use myself as this example. I'm almost done with my PhD. I'm in between the proposal and defense of my dissertation. And I paid out of pocket for my PhD. And if I was purely looking at it from a financial perspective, my PhD is not going to help me earn more money. It's not probably going to provide me different job opportunities. It's just something that I truly want to do. So I consider that discretionary spending. When I spend money on my PhD, I reduce my discretionary spending in other areas because it's not always going to be purely a financial decision. And I think families face that as well. Well, once you get a PhD, I'll call you Dr. Walsh. (laughs) <laughs> uh, you don't need to. Um, <laughs> my, my best friend's brother would, would, would make fun of me for saying that because he is a, uh, a doctor doctor. And he was like, I am never calling you Dr. Walsh. And he got mad at me. <laughs> I want to talk about a couple of your other tips, one of which is consolidating loans. Is there a case where somebody has taken out four or five different student loans over a period of time and what you are recommending, and, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, are you recommending, let me phrase it that way, are you recommending consolidating all those student loans before you start making payments back? Yeah, I think when it comes to consolidation, it, it's important to take a step back and clearly define the difference between consolidation and refinancing. Because those are two terms in, in the student loan world, I think a lot of times they get tossed around interchangeably, and they are very, very different. So consolidation would be through the federal government. They have direct federal loan consolidation. And essentially what you do is you kind of like, you lump a handful of different or a bunch of different federal loans together. You retain the federal benefits. It makes one payment instead of four, eight, 12, 16, however many, it makes your life easier. And you're not gonna lower your interest rate. So I think that could be something that really kind of simplifies people's financial lives and it makes it just easier for people to do. Refinancing, on the other hand, is where you actually take out a new private loan to essentially pay off some federal loans, some private loans. You can pick and choose. So you're simplifying, but it's a new private loan and you lose those federal benefits. You can lower your interest rate. You can lower your payments. So I think that's where people sometimes get confused on consolidation versus refinancing. There is a big difference whether or not you lose those federal benefits. So I think consolidation can simplify things without a downside refinancing, I think, could be more upside, could potentially be downside, depending on the person. I referenced the macro level earlier, and I'm coming back to that. Is broad loan forgiveness a possibility down the road here? No. So it's hard for me to predict public policy. So I I never try. I will say that this has taken a long time. I I started working at SoFi about four and a half years ago, and this has been a constant question, a constant topic. it really heated up during the, the last presidential election. And quite frankly, it's been a long time coming. And it's going through because of a national pandemic. So I think understanding how much work and how much time went into this loan forgiveness, which is very, very generous, we're encouraging people, okay, this is what we know. Whatever's left, let's figure out how to pay this back in the best way possible. It could be income-driven repayment through federal loans. It could be refinancing. It could be making normal payments. But you know, kind of plan on on making the rest of those payments if there is something left. Are you optimistic or are you pessimistic about where we will be in a year or two on any aspect of the student loan forgiveness? In other words, when I say optimistic or pessimistic, both for the economy in general and then for individuals who have student loans. I, I think 
overall optimistic. I, I tend to be a pretty optimistic person, just full disclosure here. So it's, it's hard for me to say I'd be pessimistic about something. I think number one, the forgiveness will, it'll, it'll affect a lot of people that, that we've talked to, we talked to one-on-one and it'll really help kind of add breathing room to their budget. But at the same time, the restarting of the payments will help us kind of get out of that pause that we've been in for the last two and a half years where there really wasn't clarity or certainty. And that's the biggest kind of challenge as a financial planner. And quite frankly, when you're making financial decisions, when you don't have clarity, it's really hard to make decisions. So now we have all the information and it's just about figuring out the next best action for people. So I think I, I'm optimistic that we can do that moving forward and we could stop being kind of limbo land. What is the gene in humans that allows some people, such as Brian Walsh, to be able to figure out financial planning and the concept of financial planning, which includes student loans, possibly, and everybody else who goes, I, I don't, I, I'm having trouble here. I can't even put a budget together. I, I don't know how much I spend for groceries in a month. I don't know how much I spend for fast food. I don't even know how much I spend for clothes. What is that gene that mysteriously appears in certain people like you <laughs> that allow you to make, make it, as I said in my opening, to clarify things? That you, you're able to do that for people, but why is it people can't do it for themselves? What, what is, is it a psychological mechanism? Is it a cultural mechanism? Is it a combination of several different things going on? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's time and awareness. So for context, I, I grew up in a family where we didn't talk about money. And anytime money was discussed, it was an argument. So to this day, I have a very negative relationship personally with money. I kind of take a step back and I understand that about myself. And I know that I'm not great personally with money. So I have to figure out a system and a way to make myself better with my own money. And that's very, very interesting to me to try to figure that out. So I automate everything. I use technology. I share responsibilities. My wife handles a ton of the decisions because I, quite frankly, hate dealing with it because of my upbringing. Interesting. And then I have the time to like go through and figure this out. And I think a lot of people are like that, where we all have different relationships with money based on how we are raised. And if it's understanding and just kind of going a step deeper and saying, okay, why do I feel this way? What does this mean for me? How should I set up my finances now? I think anyone can put a system in place just by asking those questions and, and be much better off. It's refreshing to hear you indicate you had a problem with money and here you're a financial planner. <laughs> I like that. Do you think that perhaps the solution is in the school system so that they're in the curriculum, there's a, at a very early age, lessons and classes in money management, starting with the very early age, simple stuff, and then moving up in sophistication? Maybe. I, I don't view that as a silver bullet because... If you look at research on financial education initiatives, financial education is, is unlike some other areas because there's a bigger decay effect with financial education, which essentially is saying, okay, if you don't use it, you lose it pretty quickly when it comes to financial topics. So if it's not applicable, like if I'm teaching a, I don't know, a junior in high school about a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA or, cons or a mortgage, these are concepts that are not going to apply in their lives for five or 10 years, they're probably not going to remember that. So I think what we'd be better off doing would probably be leveraging technology because you can automate so many aspects of your finances and then targeted education. You can learn about things by using technology where it says, okay, great, I need to save for retirement. And then I can see articles about retirement or I need to improve my credit score. Great. I can read more information about that. I think that would probably be more beneficial is using technology to stay on top of our finances rather than expecting to teach students when they're 15 years old and they're going to remember that for 30 years. The one thing I remember that my folks always told me and I ignored them, that was the one thing I didn't do, which was always put aside a certain percentage of what you earn into a savings account and the miracle of compound interest. So actually there are two things that they taught me, which I ignored, of course, yeah. my peril. That's a, that's a great point though, because those like core principles, like delaying gratification, and making trade-offs and just like core concepts like that. Studies show that teaching a child that is actually hugely influential. I think stuff like that and focusing on these concepts would be incredibly powerful and then leave like the nitty gritty stuff for down the road when they're actually going to use it because then that's when it's going to have the most value. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Before I let you go, if I had to narrow you down to the most important recommendation or tip that you could give people who are listening about student loan forgiveness in the current situation, what would that be? I think you need to take a step back and think about what your goal is related to your student loans. Because on the surface, it sounds simple, like, okay, I need to pay back my student loans. But at the end of the day, we see some people want to minimize what they're paying right now so they can fit it in with the rest of their lifestyle expenses. Some people want to pay it off as quickly as possible because they want to be debt-free ASAP. Some people, quite frankly, just want to minimize the amounts they pay back over the life of the loan. You can do any of those things with different tools and strategies and things like that, but it's important to know what you want out of your student loan payback journey. Last question, because I didn't ask it, and I just thought of it, which is what got you into the specialty of student loans as opposed to general finance or financial planning? Honestly, it was necessity. I was the, the first, my parents didn't go to college, so I took out student loans to, to go to college. That's the only way I was going to go. So I had student loans. My wife had student loans. And it just really interested me. I'm like, okay, I need to pay them back. So let's figure out the, what I need to do. And that's how I came across SoFi. I refinanced my student loans with SoFi. Six months later, they talked to me about a job. And we interact with a lot of people who are facing the same challenge. So I figured I should probably learn a lot about student loans if I'm going to be leading financial planning in a company where a majority of our members have student loans. So you were dealing with reality. So you went to SoFi instead of sci-fi. <laughs> although I, I, I do like a good sci-fi movie from time to time, although... Uh, I have to get my son to watch it with me instead of my wife. <laughs> well, that's a great way to leave it. My guest has been Brian Walsh, SoFi Bank's manager of financial planning and student loan expert. You can follow Brian on Twitter at underscore Brian M. Walsh. And for more information on SoFi, go to SoFi.com and you can download their app as well. Brian, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And join us every Thursday for a new schmear on Ira's Everything Bagel.